Hello, church family. My name is Evan Giger. This is my beautiful wife, Amber. Um, we've been coming to Cross Point for, I guess, right at five years now. And uh, the blessings that Cross Point has been for me and my family are insurmountable. Um, and as most of y'all know, if you know me personally, I am more than comfortable up here. But my beautiful wife would rather have this stage swallow her whole right now. So, uh, uh, but Amber loves the word. She loves Cross Point, and she is she is up here and going to do a very good job. I know uh, she's practiced a lot. So. Okay, today I'm going to read the rest of Acts 1, which is verses 15 through 26. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture had to be fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as God for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in our ministry. With the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong. His body burst open and all his intestines filled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language a keldama, that is, field of blood. For, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, jo Joseph called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was added to the eleven apostles. Let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for your word. Um, thank you for this sermon series we've been going through in the book of Acts. Um, Lord, I also pray for our global ministry. But like this morning, let's not forget that we have a local ministry as well that we, we need to pray for just as well. Um, I pray for Justin this morning. Um, as he preaches the gospel-driven sermon. Um, Lord, another thing close in his heart, um, I pray for our community right now. Um, I pray that those that are hurting are, are granted peace that only you can give. Um, Lord, we ask all of these things in your name. Amen. Michael, you take this. Well, good morning. <clears throat> Thank you, Evan and Amber. Uh, I may need you to come back up here and say those names for me uh, when it's my turn to read them. Uh, if you have your Bibles, obviously go to Acts chapter 1. That's A-C-T-S, not A-X-E. Uh, Acts chapter 1. And yes, we will finish chapter 1 today. Bill Hogue said, are you really going to try to finish the whole chapter today, all uh, 15 through 26, because the past six weeks, you've had like two verses at a time. And uh, but anyway, so yes, uh, and I'll promise you, we, won't, we will not be here till three or four, uh, maybe 245, something like that. Uh, but I, no, I actually, and I actually got it down to four pages of notes this morning. That's like, I really, I'm really proud of myself, and God's probably going to humble me real quick. Uh, but anyway, Acts chapter 1, if you haven't been with us, we have been in a series and where we're walking through the book of Acts and just taking our time. We have a, have a rough plan of what we're going to preach, when we're going to preach, and how long it's going to take us, uh, but we're just kind of taking it week by week, uh, taking our time through the Word and uh, allowing uh, God to speak through His Word. You can go to our website crosspointchurch.org and find the sermons there. Our, uh, you can find them on Spotify, Crosspoint uh, Community Church, Laurel, Mississippi. Just search anything possible that could be our church. Crosspoint Church, Laurel, Mississippi, 394. Anyway, uh, you'll find it. Uh, it. It's there. If you know, if, you, if you've ever tried to find a podcast or something you couldn't find, you just start putting every kind of keyword possible. Uh, but anyway, you can find it there. All right, let me jump in because this morning uh, we have... Uh, 
the, the great text that we've been looking forward to is whenever we begin to talk about the replacing of Judas or somebody filling Judas's uh, place. And then I'll just go ahead and say this. If you're new to church and you don't know, when I say Judas, I know for a lot of us, we understand exactly what we're talking about, but there may be somebody in here who do, does not know who Judas is. And so I just want to say real quick, when Jesus uh, became man and uh, he, he dwelt among us, scripture says that when he began his earthly ministry, he called to himself 12 men just 12 ordinary guys. One of those guys' name was Judas. Uh, You may have heard that that one of Jesus' disciples had betrayed him uh, and turned him over to to the Roman officials. That was a guy named Judas. So today we're in this text where uh, Scripture teaches that Judas, after selling uh, Jesus over to the authorities, uh, became remorseful but not in a spiritual brokenness uh, we don't really know exactly, but anyway, he went and hung himself, uh, is what Matthew teaches us. Anyway, so he dies, that relieves 11, and so when we get to the book of Acts, uh, we understand over the past couple of weeks that there's still the 11 apostles that were remaining. Uh, we, we found out last week that there was, uh, there was women there with them, possibly some of their wives and other women who believed there was Mary, Jesus's mother. And at this time, finally, Jesus's brothers are believing in Jesus, which is a big deal because when you read through the gospels, they didn't really believe in him until after the resurrection uh, is what most of us think. So after the resurrection, now they're believing. And so uh, where we've been so far, and I think, yeah, and so you see the arrows here. I just kind of want to make mention of this as we, because it's been a couple weeks since I, I mentioned this. And so really, uh, if you think about the book of Acts, you can think about them in these three different arrows. First of all, the arrow that's going up. Two weeks ago, Luke preached on the ascension of Christ, that how important it is in our, our Christian faith where, where Jesus goes and he takes flesh to glory with him, redeemed flesh, and now you and I can enter into the presence of God and that uh, there he sat down at the right hand of the Father. Father, he is our intercessor and our advocate. He prays on, prays on us, prays for us uh, on our behalf. And so he, he went up, and we understand that Jesus went up, and he was seated at the right hand of the Father. Next week, we will begin getting to the place where the Spirit came down. The Spirit descended as Jesus promised he would. And I'm excited to get there, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, And then so Jesus ascends, the spirit descends, and the church goes out. So that's really, you can look at those three arrows and get really a a synopsis of the book of Acts. And so I could tell you that in five minutes, or we could spend the next eight months going through eight chapters of this. And so we're going to pick that one. Uh, Anyway, so that's kind of the synopsis of the book of Acts, if you will. But I just felt like I needed to tell somebody this morning that, yes, we're here in the book of Acts, but guess what? Jesus is still on his throne this morning. That this morning that there is a occupied throne in heaven, that the Son of Man, had that he has been resurrected and ascended, and now his Father has given him a name above every name, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord this morning. He is still on his throne. Last week, we ended with the the apostles and the other believers gathered together in the familiar place of the upper room and they were praying. And now when we get to verse 15, where Amber read for us this morning, uh, we have for the first time, one of them speaks. We finally get to hear one of them. And obviously, if you've read the Bible, we knew it was going to be Luke, I mean, Peter, because he was the loud mouth anyway, right? So he's the one that always was talking. So we get to, we finally get to hear from him. But let me maybe give you some context here. John Piper helped me see this this week to see how, because really you have like these big, these big things going on, right? So chapter one, there's the, I mean, the beginning, it's the, this is the, the theme. And then you have the ascension of Christ and you have the apostles praying in the upper room and then just randomly it's, let's replace Judas. And it just seems like almost it, it doesn't fit, and obviously this is a historical narrative of the first 40 years of the church, so it's important for us to notice. But let me kind of maybe bring some context. So Jesus had ascended. They're waiting on the Spirit. But I also believe at this time there was still this elephant in the room, and it was, the, it was Judas. He was the brother that betrayed. He was the brother that defected. He was the brother that had killed himself. And so for, for up until Jesus's death, right, they, they, they had been the 12. And then now, now Judas is, he's gone and they, there's this, 
like I said, elephant in the room. Like, so what, what's going on? Did, did Jesus not know that was coming? Did, did that, did, why did he call Judas in the first place? Did, like, what happened here, right? And so there, I'm sure there's this things that are going on, these things that are talking about. Then notice this, where we ended last week, they were praying. Then out of that prayer in verse 15, Peter stands up among the brothers in which Luke t- tells us here that there were, there were the brothers. Here's that more of like family term that brothers isn't just males. This is males and females. And actually it says that there were about 120 people in this upper room. And so Peter, through, uh, they, were, they were praying, they were waiting on the Spirit. And then Peter stands up, he gets moved by the Spirit. He stands up to this 120 plus people and he has the word and this is what he says. Verse 16, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled. The scriptures had to be fulfilled. And I would like to submit this morning that that is the most important verse in all of these verses. That scripture had to be revealed. It's imperative that it it had to be revealed. Uh, Because here Peter is standing up and he's speaking to his people. So let me try to give you an illustration of, let's look at a lens to look at this. Uh, I'm gonna use a parent fell of mine to kind of maybe use uh, an illustration. So a couple weeks ago, I think two weeks ago now, uh, we were, as a Sunday afternoon or Monday afternoon, I don't remember what day it was, we were on my front porch and we were grilling. Uh, and uh, me and Ashley and Emma and Evie and Nani and Poppy, which is Ashley's parents, Brian and Susan, we just know them as Nani and Poppy. Sometimes I forget their names, uh, just Nani and Poppy now. Uh, but anyway, so we were all hanging out on the front porch. Uh, and so when you're walking into my front door from the front, from the front porch, uh, there's like two steps, it's this big wooden door, and then beside the door is like those little cool little you know, decorative window things that are on the side. I don't even know what those things are called. But uh, anyway, so what you can do is if the girls, they would step up these steps, and then they would like step over into that little window right here, and they would kind of hold up. They just play like that all the time, right? It's no big deal. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm rushing because I'm trying to grill, uh, and so I, I run inside, and I'm getting whatever I need, and I look out the, through the foyer out to the front porch, and in the window, I can see Evie is standing in that little window thing because I can see her face looking at me, right? And so <clears throat> she's already there before I open the door, and so I'm walking out, and I open the door, and I see her, and I look, and her hand is not in the door, right? And so in order to shut this door, you've really got to shut it. Like, you really got to just... Phew, Boy, if you've ever been out my front door, like it, it, so anyway, I go, and it's just like this. I literally go, foo, like that right there, and then she starts squilling, you know, death screams, like, and what had happened is her cute little left pinky finger, I mean, uh, ring finger, went into the, the door, and like, not like, I'm talking about like on the hinge side, like the very tight spot, and I had slammed her little finger in there, uh, and she starts going nuts. I didn't quite know what happened. Ashley, guys, you know, the, the mama hen, like she ran, she ran over there. Uh, and so anyway, we get to her and then I'm going to lie to you, I'm, I'm, I'm about to try to sound tougher than I actually was that night. But every parent knows what I'm about to say is that whenever your kid is freaking out and panicking, you do not want them to see the panic on your face. Right, and so I run over there, or I get her in at first, and then I just, I, I need to cry because I just hurt my little girl. And so Ashley takes her, and I go and just stare off into the, uh, to the stars and just weeping uh, so they can take care over there. But then I go back over there. But you, you, you all know what I've been there. You've all been there before that whenever it seems like things are frazzled, when things are panicking, like, is what's going on right now? Obviously, we want a dad that is gracious and kind and forgiving. But we also want a dad whenever things seem like they're frazzling that we don't see panic in their face. You follow me? And so here I think at this time, you have these 11 apostles and these other believers and it seemed like, yeah, Jesus had ascended, the spirit hadn't come yet. And there's this elephant in the room about Judas, like did God see this was going on? And here, listen to me. When we face obstacles, when we look into our father's, house, father's face, what we want to see is a fierce resolve. We don't want to see panic. 
What we see in this passage, I believe, is God's determination to his own plan. That his plan wasn't coming unhinged, if you will. That his plan wasn't getting broken up. That his plan wasn't being messed up. But what we see is that there's an invincible, inconquerable plan that Jesus or God's purpose is not crumbling, not even by the betrayal of Judas, that his plan stopped. And so in the midst of these apostles maybe trying to figure it out, what we're seeing through the Holy Scriptures is that not for a moment did the plan of God not go exactly according to plan. And he's fiercely determined to make sure his plan is carried out. And we see what we'll see in this text is that when the Holy Spirit speaks something, it will be fulfilled. Even if it takes a thousand years, it will be fulfilled. The story must go on. And is that encouraging for me and you this morning? Like just like this is just the lens that I want to look at this. This ain't even me going through the text. This is just the lens that I want us to look through this text and not just trying to figure out, oh, let's talk about lies. That's funny. And let's not, like, let's get, give us a lens to look through. And what we're seeing in all these actions and all these decisions they're making is that the Father is serious about the Father's plan about building his church and giving glory to his son. That's, what, that's what's going on. The, the, the story is going on. There hasn't, it hasn't come apart. It is still going. No, listen to me. This morning, I want you to know this, that nothing we face frazzles our Heavenly Father. We may be panicked. We may be confused, but we can look into the face of our Father, and He is fiercely, fiercely determined on His purpose. Know this, that you can sleep at night because the psalmist tells us that he is the one who never sleeps nor slumbers. He isn't panicked. His plan isn't crumbling. And so that's the lens that I want us to look at this text through this morning, that God and what we're seeing, God via the Holy Spirit is ever so serious about his plan being made known. And he's not caught off guard at all. Everybody with me? This means yes. Means no. We good? All right, here we go. If you're taking notes, <laughs> it's still chewing. There you go. If you're taking notes, number one, the first thing that we see in this text is that uh, this first thing that stood out to me two weeks ago is that Peter's denial did not disqual- disqualify him. Say, so Justin, what are you talking about? Go back to in Luke chapter 22. I'm going to read a passage that many of us have, have heard about uh, Peter. It's in Luke 22, verse 33. We know that, that Peter was the one that said, uh, said to the Lord, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times. So here's this Peter guy, right? Like Peter, the, the spokesperson all through the gospels, the one that they said that his mouth should have been the shape of a foot because he was always putting his foot in there. Here's this guy, the most zealous one, the, the one who had answered the questions, right? Here's this guy who said, Jesus, I will follow you to prison or death. And Jesus says, man, before the sun comes up, you're going to deny me three times. We know that passage, but I think a lot of times we forget about the two verses prior to that, because those two two verses prior to that is exactly what we see is happening when we get to Acts chapter one. Look at verse 31. It's going to come up on the screen, and this is Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith will not fail, and check out this verse, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That he even, here's this Peter guy, Mr. Zealous Peter, the one that we see through the book of Acts, who's like this rock, if you will. It was the same guy that had denied Jesus, even to a little girl. A big, fierce, little bitty girl, Peter was so scared that he said, no, I don't know this Jesus guy. If there's anybody that should have been disqualified, it was this guy because he denied knowing Jesus. But here we see whenever they began praying and they prayed and waited for some 10 days that Peter stands up and he begins to speak. And he says, brothers, the scripture 
had to be fulfilled. And what we see, as I said, this is one of the first things that I saw this week or the past two weeks is that here's this Peter guy that, who just made a royal mess of his faith a couple chapters ago. Now the guy who's standing up saying, hey guys, hey, the scripture had to be fulfilled. It's the same guy that had a, a big blemish on his record, if you will, is the same guy who's standing up right here beginning to lead his brothers and his sisters to trust and obey the Lord even more. Peter's denial didn't disqualify him from the book of Acts. Matter of fact, I believe that God used his mistakes to mold his heart. Because I believe in this text that we see a pastor's heart who wanted to encourage his brothers, but also direct his brothers. He, he, he wanted to say a word, he was led to say a word that would encourage those who believers that were there, but that would also, it would also give them direction, like where do we go? What do we do now? Obviously we're waiting and we're praying, but is there something we do now? And here's the truth for you, don't let past mistakes keep you from letting the Lord use you now. Right? How many of us have been crippled by yesterday's mistakes? Yesterday's failures, yesterday's disappointments, and because of that, I can't be used by God anymore. If, if, if you just knew my past, how could Peter have the audacity to stand up and try to lead these people? What a hypocrite, right? If he was in Jones County, Mississippi, if he would have stood up, somebody would have said, Peter, you sit down. You're a hypocrite. We know you, you denied Jesus. You were big and bad and bold saying you weren't, that you'd go to prison and die. But when a little girl came, you shrunk down and you denied Jesus. You sit down, you hypocrite. How could Peter have the audacity to, to stand up and lead these people? You know why? Because Peter has experienced grace. Peter could stand up and begin to lead because Peter had experienced grace. At the end of John, sitting on that seashore around the fire, they just got done with breakfast, and he experienced the grace of Jesus and redeeming him. And tell him, remind him, I'm sure he reminded Peter, hey, encourage your brother, strengthen your brother. Peter had experienced the gospel. And here's the cool thing, how, did, how could Peter do this? Because number one about the gospel is the gospel drives out guilt, child of God. And when I say guilt, I literally mean your stance before God. You, are, you and I are guilty. We have missed the mark. None of us deserve grace or an opportunity. We have missed the mark completely. We stand before God as guilty, but thanks be to God that Paul wrote in Colossians 2.14 that, that Jesus, that he canceled the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands, and he set it aside and he nailed it to the cross. Listen to me, child of God. Every sin you've ever committed, past, present, and future, Jesus took it and he nailed it to the cross. It drives out your guilt. Your guilt is no longer there anymore, child of God. Jesus nailed it to the cross of Calvary. So how could Peter do it? Because even that denial Peter had on that last night, Jesus nailed that sucker to the cross. Sorry for saying sucker, I just got excited. <laughs> he nailed it to the cross. And he's made you and I guiltless. Not only does the gospel drive out guilt, but it also drives out shame. Those are two different things. How does it do that? By the adopting love of a heavenly father. That's how it drives out shame. That we have a heavenly father who's adopted us as sons and adopted us as daughters, who showers us with grace. And listen to me, we don't know what to do with that. Like, like we, we don't take praise and love good. Like you can even see it in my girls. Now Eve is getting a little bit where she really likes it a lot. Like, but there's for a while, like anytime, like 
She, was hit, she could hit a golf ball in the yard. Then whenever I would get somebody to try to watch her, she would shrink up and like, no, like she'd get all nervous and shy. And Emma, if you try to get her, you try to talk to her, how sweet she is, she'll, she'll close. That, we, don't know, we don't know how to handle just this, this adoration or this love that somebody will pour us. Listen to me, child of God. You've been adopted to the family of God and he is madly in love with you. And that reality drives out shame. That the Father in heaven, the creator of the universe, looks at me and he does not despise me. That drives out shame. Shame has no place in the Father's house or in his presence. We come into his presence as children that he loves You have a heavenly father who delights in you. And the gospel has driven your guilt from before him, but it will also drive your shame away if you'll let it. So the first obstacle, and I still haven't even preached the text yet, is that Peter's denial did not disqualify him. Now let's get into the text. Number two, Peter strengthened them by the word of God. Peter strengthened them by the word of God. So he, he stands up, he, he comes out of prayer, these 10 days of, uh, of just praying and waiting for the spirit. And he stands up, says, brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled. Which the, check this out, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David. Dude, that dude is in line with the father. Like he, he's getting it. He's got like a direct, like for, and to remember like four weeks ago that their eyes for the first time, they connected the Old Testament and the New Testament that the spirit had led. And Peter says, listen to me, dude, the Holy Spirit led David to talk about this actually. Like he, he says it had to be fulfilled because uh, concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. And so in this passage, this is why the rest of this passage is, is really set up. So let me try to give some framework to actually study these verses. There's, there's two prophecies that he gives. You see that in, in verse 20. May his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. So that's speaking of the defection of Judas. And then uh, it says, says, and let another take his office. And so that's something that's going to happen with Matthias. And so really this whole story about the replacing of Judas is built around two prophecies and two fulfillments. And it's from that lens that we look through this passage. Stay with me. I promise you it's going to, you're going to, it's going to be good in just a minute. Is that, 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 that by these two prophecies, everything else is hinged. So we have to see that, that what Peter is doing is he is strengthening them by the word of God, both in handling Judas, but also where to go from here. We also see what we hold to be the doctrine of inspiration here where Peter says the Holy Spirit moved David to speak these things. Hey, listen to me, church. We believe that this Bible is the inspired word of God, that it's not man-made. It's not something that man came up on his own. If that's the case, then we might as well bring another book in here. We believe this is the very word of God, that the word teaches about itself in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Second Peter 1 21, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. We believe that this Bible is an inspired book written through the Holy Spirit. And we see that. That's one of those things that we see here that, that they're the very, in the first sentence that Peter says in, when the church, right before the Spirit comes, is that the Spirit is the one that led David to speak. So ultimately, not only, uh, let's think about this, just came to him, and not only was God the Father determined about his plan going forward, but even a thousand years before this, the Spirit was serious about God's plan continuing to go forward. The, 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 anyway, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll flesh that out later. So he, he strengthens them by the word of God. God's word produces strength. The first psalm that he quotes is Psalm 69, 25. Whenever 
David wrote through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is verse 20 of Acts 1. May his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it. He gives strength. He looked to the word in regards to Judas to appeal to them to be strengthened. And he told them ultimately the Holy Spirit knew that this would happen. The Holy Spirit actually prophesied through, or David through the Holy Spirit prophesied that this would happen. The God had already revealed that this would happen, that this deal with Judas, that seems like it's so out of left field. No, God had already spoke through, it, through the prophet David that this would happen. Could you imagine how encouraged they probably felt at that moment? For me and you, it's easy to go, yeah, duh, duh. But for them, one of their brothers that they lived with for the past three years had, had been gone and he, and, he, and he killed himself. Oh, did Jesus not see this coming? And Peter stands up, listen to me. The Holy Spirit through David said that this was going to happen. It didn't catch anybody off guard except for them. Man, I'm sure that was a source of confidence in God. It strengthened them. And we see that's the, that's the, that's the prophecy that his camp would become desolate. Let no one, be, no one dwell in it. And what we see, that's really answered in verses uh, 17 through 19. It says, for he was numbered, among, this speaking of Judas, he was numbered among us and he allotted his share in his ministry. Now this man... I mean, Judas acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness. So the money that he sold Jesus for, it says that there was land that be bought. Well, I'll tell you how that land was bought. Judas actually didn't go buy the land himself because he had already hung himself. But we'll get to that in a second. But falling in headlong and he burst open in the middle and all of his bowels gushed out. And here we go. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem uh, so that the field was called in their own language, a keldama, which means the field is blood. Literally, his history tells us that that place became desolate. That nobody, everybody had heard the story about Judas dying there, and they called it really the field of blood, and the place became a desolate place. The same exact thing that David had prophesied a thousand years before. <clears throat> so we see in this story that they were strengthened by God's word. Their confidence, I'm sure, was strengthened in God by looking to God's word. Not only does God's word produce strength, but also gives us direction. And that's what we see in the rest of this chapter. Is that, one, it, God's word made them look back and go, all right, we missed Judas, obviously. But God's plan is still going according to plan. And that's all the... Sometimes that's all I need to hear is that God's plan is going exactly according to plan. All right? I should get some more amens on that. But it also gives them direction. Psalm 109, verse 8 is quoted right there at the second part of Acts 120. It says, let another one take his office. So God's word gave them strength for dealing with Judas, but also gave them direction. It says, now, his place must be, must be, he must be replaced. His office must be replaced. And that's what, let another take his office. So in verses 21 through 26, we see that the word of God given them direction about what to do. So first of all that we see uh, is that there's the qualifications of the person that they were going to select. And really there's two qualifications. We see them in verse 21. The first one is that this man, uh, <clears throat> had to be someone who had been with them since Jesus' baptism. And so this is, we can bring this today. This is a, a apostle with a capital A, right? So just follow me there. And so if anybody comes around calling themselves like an apostle, ask them these questions. Were you with Jesus since his baptism? And the second one was, were you a witness of his resurrection? If that's the case, then you, you're a liar. Because that was the qualifications for these apostles is that they had to be someone who had been with Jesus since the baptism of John to witness his resurrection. And if you didn't fit those two categories, you couldn't be an apostle. So therefore, none of us can fit the bill. Cool? All right. Anyway, that's, a, that's not even, anyway. So 
That's why there's no big A apostles today. No one alive today meets those qualifications. So this is the qualifications that he must have. And then we see the method of selecting. This is the one we wanted to talk about, right? Here's the method of selecting. And so there are two guys. Well, actually, there's two guys. One of them has three names. Uh, his name's Justice or Barsabbas or, or Joseph, whatever. I don't know what the one they called him, but he wasn't important because he didn't get it anyway. Uh, but anyway, there's this guy here, but he was a guy who was there since the baptism. He witnessed the resurrection. He was gonna, he could share in the uh, apostleship of these guys. And then there's the guy, guy Matthias. There's these two guys and how are they going to pick? First of all, before we get to lots, they prayed. The first thing they did is they prayed. They said in verse 24, you Lord who know all the hearts, show which one of these two you have chosen. And then they cast lots. So if you're not familiar with what casting lots is, literally what they would do is they would take two stones, they would write Matthias on one, uh, and Justice, or Justice could have had three rocks, Justice, Barsabbas, and uh, Joseph. But anyway, there'd be two rocks, and they would take them, they would write their names on them, they would put them in a jar, and they would shake them until one fell out, and whatever one fell out, that's the one that they believed they had. So that's what happened when they choose Matthias is that his name was the one that fell out of the jar. So Justin, that seems crazy. Well, it, was very, it would be very appropriate for them to do that in their, in their culture. We see it all through the Old Testament. We see Jonah did it. When Jonah was uh, in the ship, the people on the, on the boat, they were what, casting lots to try to figure out who was in the ship. Whenever uh, you see it in Leviticus and picking the scapegoat, it would be casting a lot. You see Joshua do it, but probably more verses than all is the... Proverbs 16, 33, that says that the lot cast into the lap, but every decision is from the Lord. And so before we just make fun of them for rolling dice, don't which one to pick, really, that was just a customary thing for them. So that's what they do. Should we do that today? You don't have to. I don't think you have to as a child of God because now you have the then dwelling Holy Spirit within you. Now, I do flip, some quarter, flip a quarter for some decision-making. Coach Gray, you're going like this. Sometimes I can't pick a deer stand that I want to hunt. So I narrow it down to two. One stand will be heads. One stand will be tails. Flip it. I go to which one ever it flips to. I'm not praying to the Lord to show me which stand. I just, it makes me make a decision. I was talking to a guy this past week that had, we weren't talking about lots at all. We we're just talking about deer hunting. And he said, yeah, I used to flip a quarter uh, to pick Am I going to hunt with my gun or my bow? And then he said, like, 1999 or something like that. He, he flipped his quarter. It said bow. So he went out there and missed the biggest buck he's ever uh, seen. Uh, so he got down from the stand, sold his bow, and he don't flip quarters anymore. He just uses his gun. <laughs> <clears throat> and so, so should you today, you don't have to. We have the Holy Spirit within us, but if you want to, that's, that's what you want to do. But I don't think it's as big of a deal as we think it is. That was just the way that they thought God would move and answer their prayers when they shook it, when the one that fell out. That's what they did. Some may say, well, why not wait on Paul? Paul's right now. Well, they didn't know that, right? They didn't know Paul. The only thing they, well, they didn't know yet, but they soon find out that, that Paul wasn't Paul, y'all. He was Saul, and he was a bad dude. Definitely if there was anybody that should have been disqualified, it was definitely that dude, right? <clears throat> why replace Judas? Why do, we, why do they have to replace Judas? Replace Judas? Well, I think one, obedience, because Scripture had told him through, the, through David, let another one fill his office. But also, I think there's more there in Luke 22. This is, again, I love that you can read the Gospel of Luke and Acts, and notice that it's the same writer, by the way. But in Luke 22, Verses 28 through 30, this may have something to do with it. Uh, he tells his disciples, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials and I assigned to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table and my kingdom to sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So maybe they were thinking about that and there has to be a 12th, uh, a 12th apostle to judge the 12 tribes. I've read some people talk about the, the 12 tribes, think about the old Israel, the 12 apostles, the new Israel, the church and I don't think, I think we're just trying to find too much there. I just think that they were obedient to what God's word said and they found somebody else. Uh, maybe I could be wrong and you could tell me later, uh, but not right now. But if the Lord didn't want them to do that or didn't want them to wait on Paul, I believe that he would have shut the lid of the jar. And so that's just what happened. That's what they did. But hear me when I say this. This is so important. 
It's important. This story, filling Judas' office, is important because it's in, the, it's in the Bible and it's church history. It's what they did. But hear me when I say this. It's not the main thing in this text. It's not the focus. How do I know that? Because this is the last time you hear any of those guys' names except Peter, James, and John. Why would God put this in his word if we're never going to see Matthias' name again? Because the purpose isn't the 12. The purpose isn't the replacing of Judas. The purpose and the importance is God's plan is still going according to plan. Number three. I'll be done with this one, I promise. Number three, something else we learned. I think I covered all the verses there. Uh, told you, Bill, I was going to be able to do it. Number three, proximity to Jesus doesn't equal possession of Jesus. Proximity to Jesus does not equal possession of Jesus. We're talking about Judas, y'all. We're talking about Judas, one of the 12 that walked with Jesus for three plus years. They saw miracles. They heard the teachings. He'd been there, done that. Matter of fact, what does Peter say here? He says that he was numbered among us and he was allotted his share in this ministry. Literally what Peter said, he was doing ministry with us. He was a part of the 12 and the 72 that Jesus sent out. It was him. They had, they had sent him out. Right? He saw the miracles. He heard the teachings. But Scripture tells us that he's the one that betrayed Jesus with a kiss on his cheek. In verse 25, it says in Acts 1, it says, which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Literally, that means he went to hell to go to his own place. We read the weird account here that he had fallen uh, headlong. And Amber, I'm sorry we made you read intestines up here. Uh, mine says bowels gushed out. And so I don't know which one's better than that. But so Peter gives us that. If you read Matthew 27, it actually says he hung himself. And so what they actually think happened is that he, when he hung himself, rather the tree broke or the knot didn't work and he fell down and then he fell and off a cliff, and that's how. Anyway, so it's a little much. But the way that the land got purchased is that the officials there uh, took that money, and they went and purchased that spot after he had died, is what most people say. Anyway. But here's the reality, is that Jesus, I mean Judas, kissed the door of heaven, and he still died and went to hell. And I want you to hear me when I say this. He did not go to hell because he hung himself, but because he didn't trust Jesus. Suicide does not send you to hell. Not knowing Jesus does. God's saving hand is not stayed, nor is it shortened by the act of suicide. No single sin can evict a person out of heaven and into hell. And I would fail you today if I didn't ask you about your relationship with Jesus. I would fail you miserably as a pastor at Crosspoint if I didn't ask you, do you trust in Jesus? Because proximity to Jesus does not equal possession of Jesus. Coming to church, being around, singing songs, going to a small group, those things are great. But listen to me, proximity to Jesus does not equal possession of Jesus. Are you trusting in Jesus today? As your Lord and Savior, have you, have you, have you believed in and on him have you received his finished work? Have you, have you stopped trying to self-religious, cover up, put makeup on your wounds and your brokenness and your depravity? And today, would you just say, 
I want to trust Jesus. I want to believe in him. The reality is, is the Holy Spirit is probably revealing that to you right now. Have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? What are you holding on to for your salvation? What are you believing in? What are you trusting in? Because I would be a terrible pastor by preaching this text and not say to you, don't let that be you. Don't trust in anything other than Christ for salvation, for your eternal hope, for a chance to go to heaven when you die. Don't trust in anything other than Jesus. When we ask the question, why do we get to go to heaven? It's not because I did so and so and so and so. It's because Jesus saved me. Nothing else added to that. If we try to add anything else to that, then we've missed it. Do you trust in Jesus this morning? Will you trust in him? Last week, we got to celebrate with our sister Jennifer and her new life in Christ. And she spoke about this false sense of assurance that many people will have that they're holding on to something, that they're holding on to some false sense of assurance. But she shared her story how God gave her grace and she believed in the Lord Jesus and he saved her. This morning, will you do the same? So if you don't know the Lord in here this morning, if you're trusting in anything other than Jesus, I don't have to say it perfectly because I'm praying that as I'm speaking, the Holy Spirit is stirring your heart. And you know today if you need to trust in Jesus or not. I want to invite you to be able to do that in a little while. I'm not going to get you to say a prayer or anything like that. What I'm going to do is when I'm going to be quiet and I'm going to come stand down here. And if you need to talk, I'll be right here. Luke will be in the back. Ryan is over here as well. Uh, if you would like to talk about getting this right, I don't want proximity. I want possession of Jesus. If that's you this morning, we want to be able to talk to you. I'm going to be able to pray with you. Maybe you're just in a time in life that you need to be reminded that Jesus is still on his throne. Everything is going according to plan. May not be your plan, but he's not frazzled. He's not freaking out. He's not going, oh gosh, I didn't see this happening. He's going right on track. Maybe you need to go to the Word to find strength and direction. I just pray that whatever it is, you follow the Lord's call and obedient to his voice. I'm going to pray for us. And after that, I'm going to keep, I'm going to ask you every head bowed, every eye still stay closed and just, yeah, for us just kind of sit in this moment <clears throat> in this quietness as Michael plays over us. <clears throat> as Michael plays over us, you pray and ask for the Lord to search your heart. That you pray and I beg of you if for a moment you hear the Spirit say you need to trust in Jesus, don't try to silence that. I'll ask you to stand up and go grab Luke or me. <clears throat> we'll pray with you. We'll connect you with somebody who I can lead you. Child of God, if you're here this morning and you're struggling, I hope the Word of God encourages you this morning. That whatever you're walking through, that you'll take it to the throne. Because you have a heavenly Father who delights in your neediness. So go to him with your needs. The band's going to go ahead and come back out. And in a few, they'll start playing. And at that time, we can all stand. I just kind of want to be in this moment of silence and prayer for us.